This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Solarius, an innovative new project that uses blockchain technology to empower hundreds of artists and writers to come together and build a collaborative science fiction world. Learn more over at Solarius.network. So that's C-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-S dot network. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 308 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Gordon Van Gelder. He's the publisher of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and he also served as the magazine's editor from 1997 to 2015. He's also edited nearly a dozen anthologies, including Lonely Souls, Welcome to the Greenhouse, and The Very Best of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And we'll be speaking with him today about his recent anthology, Go Forth and Multiply, which collects science fiction stories about small groups of humans, often just a single man and woman, attempting to repopulate the Earth or to populate an alien world. And today's show is brought to you by Solarius, an ambitious new shared world project that aims to combine fan fiction and blockchain technology. Solarius bills itself as an example of the block punk genre, which is similar to cyberpunk, but with a more neutral attitude toward technology and a more optimistic attitude about the future. Blockpunk explores the ways that blockchain technology and artificial intelligence might lead to a more equitable and decentralized future, and Solarius aims to put those principles into practice by blurring the line between creators and fans. Anyone can apply to join the Solarius community, and those community members are encouraged to contribute fiction, art, video, or music to the project. The community then votes on which of those contributions to canonize, and works that are canonized become a permanent part of the Solarius world, with blockchain technology ensuring that the work will continue to exist in its original form in perpetuity. In that way, Solarius aims to avoid the sorts of constant retcons and reboots that have roiled other fan communities in recent years. The world of Solarius is a high-tech future in which colorful factions such as Vindix, Rattlers, Stargazers, and Chemix battle over the proper relationship between humanity and AI, and how it all plays out will be entirely up to the community. Authors such as Stephen Barnes, Tanana Reap Dew, Rich Larson, and David Wellington are already involved. And if you want to throw your hat into the ring, you can find out more over at Solarius.network. So that's C-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-S dot network. I also highly recommend checking out the Solarius 2018 reveal trailer, which features some very cool animation and sound design. All right, so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Gordon Van Gelder. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Okay, so you say that this book arose from a recent discussion of Tom Godwin's story, The Cold Equation. So could you tell us about that? Uh, well, it's not recent anymore. It, it, this book took, a, I don't know, three years more to, to put together. Somewhere or other, probably on Facebook, yet another argument about the cold equations came up. It's like, you know, if two years go by without somebody arguing about the cold equations, something's wrong. Hmm. So I don't even remember what this one was, but it was going on. And, I, you know, it, it prompted me to pick up, to um, grab my copy of the John Campbell letters off the shelf. And... I know Campbell's said a few times that he got Godwin to change the gender of the stowaway. And I wanted to find an exact quote from that. And so I'm paging through looking for the quote. And I find a reference in one of Campbell's letters, I think to Sturgeon, about how he tried to do the same thing with the pig's story that he did with uh, the cold equations. And I never noticed that before. And I look and say, what pig's story is this? So I, I start poking around, and I don't remember. Cold Equations was, I think, July or August '53, I think. And so I'm looking through issues in that uh, vicinity, and there's a story called "On the Care and Breeding of Pigs." And I think it was December '53. And so I, I take a look at it and figure that's probably a match. So I scare up a copy of the issue, and. It, it, it's clearly the story that Campbell was talking about. Uh, and the story really, it really made, uh, made, was a marvel to me. It was just it, so, you know, like I said in the book, it, it's like the past is not just another country, it's a whole other world. It was a really compelling story, but it was so different from anything that you see nowadays. It had such a different 
um, set of standards and morals or mores, and, and it you know it was on the theme of repopulation, and it just happened to come along right around the same time that I was at um must have been it was a, the World Con in Texas is that 2012, and it was I was having dinner with some people, and uh, one of them brought up. The Queen Bee by Randall Garrett. And she started going on about how, what an awful, terrible story this is, and it's the worst, you know, most <laughs> putrid story ever published in the field. And I vaguely remembered it, but I got home and I looked that up, and it's another repopulation story. And the two of them just sort of coinciding got me thinking, you know, this used to be a big theme in the field, and it's sort of completely gone away now. And that's what really started me off on the book. Mm -hmm. I want to set this up for listeners who might not actually even know what the cold equations is. Oh, it's, it's this story where there's a um, a colony in space that needs medicine, I think, like uh, vaccines yeah. or something. And um, so there's a, a ship that's going to deliver these vital vaccines. And it turns out that there's a, a young girl who's stowed away aboard. And the captain has to throw her off the ship because the weight of the, the weight of her on the ship is going to ruin the whole mission. And uh, I guess, could you just talk about the <laughs> the, the, the long history of people um, arguing about the story? Well, it, it was, uh, it's a deliberately controversial story. The, the gist of it is that the added weight of the stowaway means there isn't enough fuel to complete the mission. And so if the pilot of the ship keeps the stowaway on board they won't be able to rescue save the lives that they're going to save by bringing the the medicine uh so the the ship captain and it's a one person ship is in the position of deciding do we keep this stowaway and you know keep this the stowaway alive and fail our mission and all these other colonists or settlers die or do we throw the stowaway out the out of the ship and as I understand it, Campbell, the author of the story is Tom Godwin. And John Campbell put him through, I think, four rewrites, had him change the gender of the stowaway to female. Um, and it wound up being one of the most controversial stories, I, I guess, in the history of the field, because every few years somebody's got to take another position on it. Um, I remember Damon Knight had a great <laughs> letter that we ran in the New York Review of Science Fiction, maybe 1990, 91, where Damon calculated the weight uh, or guesstimated the weight of the stowaway. And it, she was a teen, so he probably figured under 130 pounds. And then he found 130 pounds worth of other objects in the ship that they could have thrown out instead and kept her alive. Uh, you know, and he was down to like the weight of a ballpoint pen, things like <laughs> that. Uh, Campbell's own letters at the time say that basically the story should be controversial because A, humans and especially men are conditioned to fight to keep the women in the, of the species alive in order to um, allow the species to continue. And he said also the story is basically an argument for human sacrifice. It's not spelled out in those terms, but that's the gist of it. So it, it's a very controversial, very provocative story. Well, isn't it the case that, um, like the Damon Knight suggestion, didn't, didn't Godwin keep coming up with ideas for how he could save the stowaway and Campbell kept rejecting them because he, he thought that was, that should be the whole point of the story, that there is no way to save the stowaway? It, it could be. I, I haven't seen that, but I'm, it's entirely possible. I know there's a British writer, I'm pretty sure it's E.C. Tubb, uh, had almost exactly the same idea right around the same time. You know, in fact, I'm almost certain it's one of Tubbs' stories in Alien Dust. But his stowaway was male, and I think he does save the uh, life of the stowaway. And uh, apparently Tubbs said, you know, I got there first, but if only I'd thought, you know, if only I'd, I'd had this different spin on it, my story would have been the famous one and not Godwin's. Yeah. Okay, and so 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 I guess it sounds like Campbell saw the controversy that that story 
uh, elicited and then he, uh, he, he did he go looking for other stories like this care and breeding of pigs he was intentionally looking for something else that would stir things up that's pretty clear from the letters he the main correspondence of his i saw was ex- an exchange between him and ted sturgeon and and he said something like you know i'm not just trying to flick the boys glands ted i'm trying to attack their underlying assumptions and it, that's where the pigs thing came up. He said, the story may not have gotten to you, but it really bothered um, Kelly Fries and his wife, and they were arguing about it for days. And it's real clear from the correspondence that <laughs> in today's parlance, Campbell was trying to sh- uh, stir the shit. <laughs> uh, I mean, he was he loved provoking people to begin with. And, and I was going to say, in today's, in today's parlance, he was trolling. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think of it in those terms because trolling tends to suggest that it's someone, it, trolling tends not to be by done, done by someone in the position of power. Whereas Campbell was clearly in charge of the magazine, but he was definitely, however you want to put it, definitely trying to get reactions out of people and, um, you know, Campbell has a long history of this and t- his editorials would frequently take uh, very strong stands on things, and then he'd welcome uh, angry letters in response. Mm-hmm. One of the great things in researching this, the Go Forth and Multiply, was that I read through scads of 1950s issues of different science fiction magazines. And um, Campbell especially was, you could see him you know, just trying to, like you said, push the buttons or there was one nonfiction piece in there by Don Kingsbury that was about how beneficial war is in terms of clearing out the um, the bad members of the species or something like that. And it, Dave Truesdale told me he was in touch with Kingsbury about it. And Kingsbury said, yes, that piece, Campbell deliberately had me make, you know, change it to make it more controversial and more provocative. Uh, so Campbell was do- was obviously doing this all the time. It's interesting because the story of the care and breeding of pigs, the premise of it is that there's just a small group of survivors out of all the human race, and there are only two men who can still breed, and one of whom is a teenager. And um, and basically they're going to have the two men marry all the women. There are something like 12 or 15 women or something, and then they're all going to try to impregnate as many of them as they can. And I feel right. like by today's standards, this story doesn't seem that controversial, <laughs> especially compared to some of the other stories in this book. That, well, that's why part of what I found so fascinating about it, because it was clearly coming from a, a standpoint, an approach that used to be very common, but is no longer prevalent or that all that common in our society. Uh, you know, there's an under, there are a lot of underlying religious assumptions in that story. And the uh, young prota- protagonist is under a lot of pressure, or he seem- goes through a lot of tension about the issue of marriage, as I recall. And the older character, you know, who's basically trying to explain this is how it's got to be, you know, you know, you know how on the farm you used to raise pigs. That's what we we males have to be like now. You know, this is animal husbandry here. And the younger character was like, was taking more of a, a fairly traditional Christian standpoint of saying, no, I believe in marriage and one, one man, one woman. And, it, you know, the story was such a window into a 1950s mindset that I think largely went out the, you know, it, didn't entirely it still hasn't entirely disappeared from our our culture of course but so much of it changed in the 60s and 70s that to look back at it now it, it looks so vastly different from everything you read in the majority of science fiction magazines anyway it, it's like I say another world yeah i guess we should set up that these kinds of stories that you're 
publishing in this book, this these sort of there's a, one man and one woman or a small group of men and women and women and they have to try to repopulate the whole species. There have been tons and tons and tons of these stories. I remember when I first started submitting fiction, you would read the guidelines for magazines and it would say no Adam and Eve stories. Right. And I was just like, what what does that even mean? Like why why is that something they have to specifically tell people not to send in? Could you talk about that? You know, it, I'm not sure where to start. I, I remember starting out in the 70s and seeing the same thing. I, I think George Sithers had that in his long uh, standard form letter for uh, when he was editing Asimov's. And he said, no, Adam and Lee, Eve stories. And, of course, he'd run some. <laughs> it was, you know, the flip side of this tradition is that every time you put out, you know, the, the edict and say, I don't ever want to see any of these a number of writers take that as a challenge <laughs> to say, I'm going to sell you the story on exactly what you don't want to see. But, you know, the, uh, the archetypal story of, uh, it turns out, you know, it's a science fiction story of two characters. And it turns out at the end that his name is Adam and hers name is Eve. There were so many variations in that. They grew so tiresome and so cliche so quickly that a lot of magazines started saying, no, 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 we don't want to see any more of those. I remember them fading away by the 80s. And I think I think Mike Armstrong had a story called something like, absolutely, the, positively, the last Adam and Eve story ever. Mm-hmm. I think I think it ran in FNSS, if I remember right. But I, I know that's, it's not the last Adam and Eve story I can think of. But I know that by that the time that one ran, the, um, <laughs> what my daughter would call the meme had run its course. Well, yeah, just to make this clear, so you're reading these stories and you think it's in the present or the future or something and there's a big disaster and there's only two survivors and then it turns out that they're Adam and Eve and they're, it, this story is actually set in the past and this is, you know, all humans came from these two characters that you've been reading about. And it just does seem, yeah, there's just something about that idea that people who are submitting stories to magazines just can't help themselves to to write that right it was one of those uh, stories that science fiction would lend itself to so readily and newbies would be drawn to it you know it's just kind of like um you know like ants going to a sugar cube <laughs> uh you know they're various other ones i remember in the late 70s when video games you know it moved beyond pong and got really big Sithers said he was getting inundated with video game stories too. And I know he ran one, I think it was by Rudy Rucker. And he put a note in there that said, now this is the kind of video game story that we want to see. You know, the implication being all that slush that you guys have been sending <laughs> sending in. No, is no good. This is how you do it. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, so, th- so there have been all these stories where, you know, at the end you have, uh, you know, an adult man and an adult woman and they are going to repopulate the human race and then but the stories in this book are people interrogating it seems like mostly that you know that that known story framework and so it's kind of like what a lot of these stories it seems like are or what could go wrong with that kind of a a, a setup yeah definitely and i know one of the things i got interested in while i was researching the book was sort of seeing how the concept evolved a lot of the Adam and Eve stories came sort of in conjunction with the the A bomb, because the whole concept of uh, you know of Earth life on Earth getting eradicated through human stupidity and the whole race having to start all over again, it was, it was you know pretty um, front and center in the minds of a lot of people, and so naturally it came out readily in the fiction. And so, you know, I, I know the um, the Sherwood Springer story, which is, I thought, I think a really good take on that theme where, you know, man and a woman survive the, um, I think it is, is it bombs in that? I think so. And it's some sort of destruction of, of civilization, and they're the ones tasked with repopulating. That pretty much plays it straight. Then you see by the 1950s, a lot of writers are goofing around with the same theme. It's no longer as threatening or as compelling. There was one story I didn't put in the book called, um, 
otherwise known as Eddie or something like that. It was by um, uh, it, his name will come to me in a second, <laughs> but it was basically a pun story where the last man and last woman meet up, except um, she's much older than him, and it it ends on a pun with Eddie being short for Oedipal. And it, it it it's not a terrible story, but it's really what I consider magazine filler. And it it to me it was a mark that this theme is not nearly as threatening to readers as it was ten years earlier for readers. Well, right, but so a lot of the, the ways a lot of these stories play out. I mean, you have you know, what if the there were the last man and the last woman, but they only had daughters. That's no land right. of nod. What if it was the last man and the last woman, but the woman was a, a murderer. Uh, right. You know, and then what if the last woman was, uh, you know, had um, severe learning uh, difficulties? Um, right. Or, or Damon's night story. You know, what if there were just the two of them? <laughs> and, you know, without giving the punch way, line away, you know, what if something happens where to one of them where the other one can't reach them? So there, it's. There's definitely a lot of riffing on the same theme. Um, and so, like, this, this story, No Lands If Not, you, you quote Theodore Sturgeon as saying that this story, uh, he says, uh, it needed doing. Could you talk about what do you think he meant by that? Yeah, he he felt it pulled its punch at the end. And I, I actually talked with someone who knew him, uh, Bob Brown out in Seattle, and said, yeah, Ted used to do stuff like that a lot. You know, he'd sent in a letter to the magazine praising it in one, praising the story in one hand and then saying, but it doesn't really live up to its potential. I'm pretty sure what Sturgeon meant was that the story would have had more impact if either they hadn't, the last kid born in the, to ruin the story, there's a lot of question over what's the gender of the last kid going to be. But I'm pretty sure Sturgeon wanted that or thought the story would have more punch if it hadn't ended with the uh with a, another male coming into the species mm -hmm. so i think that's where he felt it, it you know it came up short uh, well because it was it was interesting with this story because as we were saying there have been so many stories where you have the last man and the last woman at, at the end of the story and they get together and even in this story i think there's a discussion about how the stories always end at that point and don't mm -hmm. get into what's going to happen next in the, yeah. the, this idea that there's going to have to be a lot of inbreeding, um, right. you know, and, it, and it's like people had never really, you know, stories had never really grappled with that. Well, like, obviously, the, the Springer has, it, I think it's, it's hard, it, it's a hard subject to tackle dramatically, in a, you know, in the form of a story that's liable to sell well, it'd be interesting, some to still to see someone try that because as you say no one's really tackled it in a long time um but yeah i i do think for a dramatic sense it's very easy to lead up to that that you know adam and eve climax rather than getting into the nitty-gritty and saying okay how's this really going to work right because there's a lot of um you know so some of the, the the plausibility is an issue with a lot of this these setups because um, first of all you have to have some scenario where everyone on Earth is killed off except mm -hmm. like two people and where they could there there's some hope that humanity could come back from this and it's kind of hard to come up with too many plausible scenarios whereby that would happen right that you know how do these two people happen to survive and how and the earth you know everyone's died off on the earth but it's still possible to come back from that right although i think there's it it's almost a genre convention now that you could probably uh resolve that with a little hand waving some of the stories have people in caves at the time of the uh cataclysmic event or you know I, i've seen so many of these now can they all blur together or like in hyperbaric uh, chambers and things or, or there's a John Brunner story where the the protagonist is in, the one guy in space when the solar flare hits and, you know, has to deal with the idea that he's the only human left. So, in, you know, in that, there's a case where he's all alone. Mm 
Um, but uh, I mean, like, you know, I was reading um, the TV tropes page about this, and uh -huh. they're claiming that the um, sort of the minimum viable number of people is about 500 at, for a breeding population uh, in for uh, for the population not to be done in by inbreeding. I don't know. Did you did you look into any of that kind of while you were putting this book together? I did a little. In fact, it, I found a, an epigraph. Um, it was a book that came out while I was working on the whole thing called The Knowledge by Lewis Dart Dartnell, which was <laughs> how do we build civilization in the aftermath of a cataclysm? And he says that two survivors, a male and a female, is the mathematical minimum for, for continuation of the species. In fact, I think that Kingsbury article might have been one that tackled the subject, the one I mentioned before that ran in, in Astounding. Um, and I know I've read some others. <laughs> Plus, in several of the stories, uh, mostly the ones Campbell edited, there's a an older male whose job in the is in whose jo whole job in the story is to explain to the other characters just what the science is behind all of this. Um, so it, I, I've read a fair amount of it, but I don't claim to be an expert on it. But there are at least some people, it sounds like, who think that it it is viable for just two people to to repopulate yes. the world. Mm, that's interesting. I mean, um, speaking of Campbell, I mean, it seems like a convention of some of these stories and maybe a lot of science fiction in general is that there's a wise old man character or a super rational alien who whose job is to uh, explain to the characters why their social mores are uh, are sort of... Um, passe or irrelevant. Yep. Um, you say that in, in a number of these stories. You, you suggest maybe Campbell uh, was intent, was telling people to insert a character like this into them? Yeah, that was that was my hunch when I noticed that it showed up in the Jat Coast, in the two stories that I reprinted from Astounding. Um, but I asked Bob Silverberg about it, and he said it, he didn't think it was that likely. Um, it's probably just as likely that the writers recognize the dramatic need for it themselves and put them in. I know it. I saw the same convention show up in at least one British story that Campbell wouldn't have had his hands on. So I don't think it was just something that he was doing, but I do think it was probably something he, it, you know, it's, it's an easy tool to apply when needed. I, you know, I, was, I think I even put the joke in the book. I, I was saying that, in most of these cases, the, the old engineer who's or the old parental figure who's got to explain everything to the youngins is in his 60s or 70s. <laughs> and, you know, unless they were subjected to um, radiation or something, there's no reason that they couldn't be fertile. <laughs> and I'm amazed no one wrote the story where the um, old engineer knocks off the young, uh, the younger, hmm. the young bucks and you know, winds up as the only the only um, fertile male left in the species. Well, like I wanted to mention this uh, this story, another rib, as an example mm -hmm. of the super rational alien kind of playing this role. Um, yep. And uh, so the premise of this story is that the there's a crew of survivors from Earth, and they're the last humans alive, but they're all men. Um, but they have an alien aboard their ship that can. Uh, that offers to to transform any volunteers into women using advanced technology. And this was one of those stories for me where I feel like it would be very controversial today for different reasons than it was when it was written. Yeah, that that one. And there was another one that I wanted to use and couldn't by uh, Bob Shaw um, called Call Me Dumbo, which is this, a similar scenario uh, I won't get into the whole story now, but it, it, that one also involved ge uh, gender change. And if I remember right, and it's been a while since I've reread it, another rib. In that one, after they go through the gender change from man to woman, they're capable of breed of you know of giving birth to children, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know it, it was a a, a necessary, an interesting science fictional leap to get to that to that point i'm pretty sure if i'm remembering my history right that 
gender change operations were, you know, at least um, becoming theoretically possible, if not actually being attempted by that point. Well, you actually you say in the note that there had been one ten years prior to the story being published. Okay. Okay. Yeah, somewhere in Scandinavia, I think. Yeah, or, Den Denmark, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought I remembered that. So it it was obviously one of those um, concepts that was seeping into, you know, it's the kind of thing people read in the news, in the newspaper, and science fiction writers glom onto it immediately and say, oh, I can get a story out of that. Right, but one thing I found so striking about the story was that the, the, the story is clearly promoting the view that this is, that, that create, you know, transforming two of the men into women in order to enable breeding is the right thing to do and the rational thing to do. Um, yep. But the characters in the story are, are so horrified by this um, yeah. and express it in such, uh, you know, vituperative terms that that, that doesn't feel, it, it feels like just from, an, as you said, something from another planet um, you yep. know, to, to a modern reader. Yeah, especially, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's from an era when homosexuality was still pretty much closeted. Uh, you know, that story is written by Marion Zimmer Bradley and uh, Juanita Colson. And when I was putting the book together, Juanita mentioned in emails that she'd been influenced by that Sturgeon story. Um, oh, God. A, a World Real Lost, is that the one? Um, with the, the one with the birds. And it's from the 50s and it has the clearest homosexual subtext of anything in the science fiction field for a long time. And I know that was definitely, from what Juanita said, that was definitely on their minds when they were when they were writing the story. The co-author in the book is listed as John J. Wells. Is that a pseudonym? That, right. That was um, it. It was a pseudonym. Juanita explained why it was basically an inside joke between her and Marion. Right. I know Juanita said she wanted to put to keep the same byline on, but I thought I gave her the full credit in the bio, author bio. Yeah, I, I may have uh, I may have just missed that. Um, well, you mentioned the story, um, the Queen Bee, that that your yeah. friend said it was the the most rightly reviled story ever, or something. Could you talk about why why it's so reviled? <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Well, the the gist of the story is that a, a team of you know explorers or scientists crash land on a planet. And I don't remember what the breakdown of the group is, four men and three women or something like that. And one of the women, the the uh, titular character, basically wants all the men to herself and kills off or arranges for the other char other women to die. Um <laughs> I wish I could remember the plot better, but Yeah, no, that, that that's right. Yeah, yeah. She murders okay. the other two women. But basically, uh, the men are, are, you know, are not enthralled with her. She's a murderer for one thing. But they they know they need her alive to, you know, for breeding purposes. So the resolution they come up with at the end is that they decide to lobotomize her. I know that Vonda McIntyre and Joanna Russ both singled this story out in in fanzines in the late 60s and 70s and said this is the story they read that made them realize there was no place for women in, in the field you know this was as clear a message to women that this is a boys welcome to the boys club stay out as, as they could get um uh, well and, and even before you get to the 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 conclusion um there's just just stunning stuff about the the men punching the women in the face to get them to do what they want and stuff. It's yeah. just jaw-dropping stuff. Yeah, I, I know when I was, Kish Johnson, I think she taught it some, uh, in um, Kansas in a course there. And I know she said, the thing about the story is that it's all done without any irony or any, you know, um, sense that... I, I don't agree with her on this. I think there's one moment where Garrett winks into the uh, the wings, but uh, she felt like it's just so 
you know, overwhelmingly misogynistic sort of <laughs> through and through that it's really hard to, to fathom by today's standards. And probably hard to fathom by 1950s standards, too. You know, it had never been reprinted before I brought it out again in this book. You said that Joanna Russ wrote a novel that was uh, kind of a response to that? Well, uh, We Who Are About To, you know, which is uh, sort of turning the whole, the, um, the reproduce to save the civilization theme on its head and saying, no, you know, let, let civilization die. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, but she, some people thought that she wrote it specifically in response to the Queen Bee. From what I could tell, she was specifically responding to um, a Dark Over Landfall by Marion Zimmer Bradley, which was another one of these you know, um, columns or a team lands on a planet and have to reproduce. And Joanna felt that MZB's take on it was that women need to um, understand that they've got to be the womb and they've got to handle the reproducing side of it. And Joanna's attitude was kind of like, uh -uh, no, 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 doesn't have to be, count me out. That's interesting because there's another story, um, it's the Paul Anderson story, it's called Eve Times Four, which seems yep. to be just explicitly interrogating the assumptions of the the Randall Garrett story. You mentioned this in the in, in your notes. I, you know when I, I when I read that one after reading the the Garrett I, I seriously wondered if Garrett and Pohl had been swapping notes or if they'd been working in, side by side, you know, in adjoining offices because the two stories are so similar in setup and execution. You know, even down to I think both stories have some kind of like galactic surveyor's rule book or something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I know the Paul Anderson story does uh, because that's sort of the punchline of the whole thing that no, there's no such rule in our book. But the you know a set of guidelines for all the, the members of the galactic expl explorers crew that you can do this, can't do that, and. and Paul Anderson definitely played a lot around with this theme a lot. I, 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 I tracked down five or six stories of his that were some variation or another. He had that novel Virgin Planet, which I think first ran in Galaxy. And, and there were a couple others. It, it was clearly something that uh, interested him to mess around with. And the Eve Times 4 one just seemed like his best take on it. And it was so directly, you know, rebutting the Garrett story that the, the two of them just needed to run together. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct that in both stories, there are these kind of galactic regulations that require survivors on a, you know, maroon survivors to, to breed with each other in order to propagate the human species or preserve it if, if uh, they're the only survivors. And, and yeah, and the, um, the Paul Anderson story plainly plays that for laughs or, uh, right. you know, um, so you mentioned that in this book that when you were the editor of FNSF that you never published one of these stories during your entire 18 years. Can you talk more about sort of why you think that these stories that had been so popular just vanished so completely? Oh, sure. It's pretty, it was pretty obvious to me that the main reason they vanished was techno technological. You know, I ended the book with the Kate Wilhelm story about clones, the story where late the sweet bird sang, which, you know, seriously considers the potential involved in, in the technology of cloning, which tech, which wouldn't have been around 20 years earlier, but by the early 70s was real enough to, Kate was great at, you know, seeing something in the news and thinking the implications of it through right away. I mentioned that because by the you know it, into the seventies and well into the eighties, reproductive science had gotten so far beyond what it was in the fifties that you know writers had couldn't couldn't seriously suggest in most cases that one man and one woman uh, wouldn't have frozen embryos 
you know, in their spaceship just in case of something. The, the technology had gotten much more advanced. I, I remember while I was researching it, there was a Jim Kelly story, I think from the mid-90s. I may have even quoted it somewhere in the book. Because it just, you know, it was just like a toss-off line about all the stuff that they had on board the spaceship for this adventure and all the stuff included enough embryos and to um, you know, <laughs> to repopulate an entire planet if they needed it, something like that. So it, it was, you know, by the time I started editing FNSF in 97, um, it was hard, it would be hard to go back to a 1950s mentality and say, you know, we don't have the technology needed for this kind of uh, reproductive effort when it was pretty, you know, it wasn't a far stretch to say that we have it now. So, it, of course, it's real easy to imagine that we would have it in a few years into the future. So I think that, as much as anything, did away with the, or led the, um, this theme, this um, topic to disappear from the field. I did see while I was researching the book something of a resurgence of it in the last few years. And it's clearly just coming from a um, more anxiety that climate change or geopolitical uh, tensions are in, indeed going to lead the world to be wiped out. And how are we going to repopulate if that does happen? So it, it's obvious that, you know, it's we started in the book with a lot of stuff that is um, born out of anxiety from the A-bomb and nuclear war. And then that sort of fades away and technology advances. <laughs> and then we come back around to nowadays where people are still feeling are feeling anxious again about the future of the planet and the future of the species. Yeah, well, you mentioned the the Kate Wilhelm story that she was really good at seeing the implications of technology, and even reading the story now that involves cloning. I mean, this was uh, the story was published in the seventies, I think. You know, twenty years or so before actual cloning, and she she has the um the fact that the clones have shorter lifespans and uh, mm -hmm. fertility problems and things like that. Were those yep. sorts of things widely understood by people, or was that a, a really um you know showing a lot of foresight on her part? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I wish I could email her and ask her right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not certain. I know Kate would have... Uh, I'm pretty sure some of that would have been known in the 70s, just from the experiments that they did have. Cause, and I know I remember when, um, when Dolly the Sheep was cloned in the 90s, that by that time, people were definitely aware of some of the uh, the risks and dangers and the potential for a shortened lifespan. There's another great cloning story by Steve Popkiss. It's called The Ice. And that's where a kid's growing up and he discovers that he's a clone of a great hockey star and he contacts the other clones. And one of them is in a wheelchair and another one has a, other issues. And it's really nicely understated, but it really, to me, drives home just how different two clones are. Everyone likes to act like two cloned beings will, will wind up exactly the same when the reality is so much different from that, you know, from the uh, initial concept. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my sort of pet peeves in science fiction is that the clones are all sort of creepy zombie, yeah. you know, things and not just sort of like twins of people who, you know, of older people, basically. I Right. I know Greg Benford did a science piece one uh, somewhere where he said, well, I'm a clone. You know, my brother and I are identical twins. Yeah. Yeah. I thought one thing that was interesting, uh, you know, reading through these stories is that about half the authors are, are quite well known to me. And about half of them are, are I've never I don't think I've ever heard their names before. Um, and I was just curious to get your thoughts about why you think some of them are well known and some aren't. And does it have. How how well does that correlate with the quality of their work? Oh, it's that's hard to say. It, I did find it while I was putting the book together. I found it kind of interesting how like family stories would come out while I was researching the authors, 
uh, you know, one of the stories is by a woman named Alice Eleanor Jones. It's a great story. I thought it was really, really strong. Yeah. She she sold a few other stories to some of the slick magazines in the 50s. That, like, um, and she was married to a, a fairly well-known science fiction writer of the time named Homer Nearing, who wrote kind of, um, I think, math stories or engineering stories. I think math. And he taught for years at a pretty a prestigious high school or college in, in Pennsylvania. Anyway, uh, when I, cont- I tracked down their nephew, and he said that story was a big kind of family gag, you know, that uh, Uncle Homer would would say, oh, yeah, you know, the awful male character in there, that's based on me, and they'd all <laughs> laugh about it. Uh, but, you know, so many of these stories are involved with um, men and women in – you know, high uh, high tension pressure cooker situations. That it it was clear assembling the, the book that a lot of the writers had some kind of um had it had some sort of experience of that themselves that they were then reflecting in their fiction. But as to why some of them worked out, you know, are famous now and why some of them aren't, it's it's really tough to generalize. I mean, Richard Wilson. His story is one of the best in the book, in my opinion. But his name is barely known now, I think. But, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, he was very well known and highly regarded. But he never never really broke out, never had a great, you know, um, top-ranked novel or anything that would remember him by these days. Was he, one of, you, one of them you mentioned, he, one of these authors was one of the Futurians and... You know the other names you recognize, but but this was it was it was it, was it Richard Wilson? Was that him? Yes, he was one of the Futurians. Yeah, he was also um, he worked at Syracuse University, I think, in the publicity the public relations department. And as I understand it, he's one of the main reasons that Syracuse University, their library, is one of the great repositories for uh, science fiction papers. That he was one of the people who saw you know, even in the 70s, that these writers' papers needed to be saved and were going to be valuable. And he got Syracuse to get their hands on a lot of them. You mentioned um, John Campbell trying to push people's buttons so so much. Would you say that that was successful as a marketing strategy or like, did you know, needn't he have bothered or, or, or does that sort of button pushing controversy lead to... Uh, the stories being better known. That's tough to say. Um, I think that was just wo- woven into who he was. You know, I, I, I think I mentioned to you by email. I've recently read this upcoming biography of, of Campbell by Alec Nevala, Nevala Lee, and I, I think from having read that, I think Campbell just naturally liked to challenge people. You know, a lot of writers have have anecdotes about going up to Campbell's office and him just kind of <laughs> haranguing and berating them with, you know, some with this or that until they responded in some way that he'd say, "There, there's a story idea. Now go and write it." So he definitely loved the the you know intellectual challenges implicit in science fiction. Because I feel like today, I think people are a little more averse to controversy. I think people are afraid yeah. of becoming the next, um, you know, victim of an internet hate mob or something. Oh, very definitely. Uh, and, you know, whether or not it's a good thing is open to argue to uh, argument, but there's definitely uh, in in the internet era. Well, I'll, I'll tell you an example. I was just reading an interview with Robert Block, and Block said when he started out writing in weird tales in the 30s or 40s, it it was just assumed that you wrote a story, you sold it to weird tales, it came out, it was on the stands for 30 days, and then it was gone. Nobody thought the stuff was going to stick around. Nobody thought it would be collected in books or remembered. It was, you know, it was um, the Reddit of its day. Is, is Reddit the one or Snapchat the one where stuff is only up for a day and then it's taken down? 
Oh, well, Snapchat is theoretically that's how it works. Okay, then it's just, it was a Snapchat of its day. Uh, there, there definitely wasn't the same level of accountability as there is now. And it, that that accountability definitely makes people more uh, averse to doing something that's liable to be misunderstood. Um, I read a biography of Shirley Jackson not long ago, and in the early 60s, she wrote a piece that was meant to be funny for one of the Cosmopolitan or one of the big magazines, oh, Saturday Evening Post, about why I'll never go to England again. And it was kind of riffing on things she didn't like about England. And apparently she got droves of hate mail over it from people saying, oh, England's great. It, you know, and it's the kind of thing where she would have said, you know, dude, I was just joking. <laughs> but I, I think she wound up even doing up a form response letter <laughs> and said, you know, if you don't like my, wait, um, don't shake my tree if you don't want to eat the peaches or something like that. Huh. I mean, did you have any um, hesitance about doing this anthology, given how controversial some of these stories still are? I I didn't. I, I did wonder if anyone would respond that way to the book. But I also thought that, hey, most of these stories are 50, 60 years old. Is anyone really going to get that worked up about a, a story from 1959? It, it just, it, it seemed to me that the historic value of these stories was going to be more important than than worrying about you know i i didn't think it was that likely that there'd be an internet mob at my uh, virtual <laughs> door you know screaming how could you reprint the the queen bee don't you know it's awful i mean have have you gotten responses to the book like just just in general not all that many i i did see one person uh, on Facebook, making that uh, that kind of, you know, oh, Van Gelder reprinted the Queen Bee. Oh, you know, look what that means. <laughs> uh, but I haven't seen all that many responses to the book in general. You know, it, it hasn't gotten wide distribution. It's not in most bookstores. Um, so, it, and the reviews have, have pretty much all picked up on what I was trying to do, as opposed to reading it with a sense of how can I be outraged by this book instead of looking at it saying, you know, how did this, how did this, um, this whole subject evolve? And, you know, what were these stories actually do, uh, doing? Or what were they really about? Which is what I found so fascinating about them. So it, I think by and large, the reception has been very good. You mentioned that this idea has had sort of a resurgence in the past couple of years. You mentioned uh, Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, right. Chris Beckett's Mother of Earth, Greg Van Eekhout's The Boy at the End of the World, Joe Hart's The Last Girl, and there was a TV show, I actually never even heard of it, called The Last Man. Right. Um, what did you think of those, or how would you contrast them with the stories in this book? Honestly, I, I can't say that I've read all of them all the way through. Uh, so I, I can't really answer that all that well. I do think it's interesting to see how someone like Neil Stevenson has taken this, the theme and or, or Chris Beckett definitely, and definitely brought it up to, you know, more up to date. Um, but it, it, it's hard to generalize, it's hard to say too much beyond that. You mentioned, too, uh, in, in the acknowledgments that you thank a bunch of authors that I'm, I'm familiar with, like Greg Baer, Kish Johnson, John Kessel, Barry Malsberg, and Paul DiFilippo. I was just curious, did they did they read this in draft or offer feedback, or like what was their what sort of it, involvement did they have? It varied. Like, it, you know, Kish and I talked about the Queen Bee. In fact, she was, I think, helped me track down the, the first copy of the story of it that I found, or, that I read. Um, I don't remember, Paul DiFilippo and I bounced ideas off of each other. Barry Molesberg was probably the most helpful. And he looked over a draft of the introduction uh, and gave me some really good feedback on that. He he told me also, he, we'd never found this one, but he thought he remembered a story or half remembered a story from the 50s about a guy who is basically approached by aliens and said, we, we're out of hum uh, males 
we need uh, fertile males like you to come and save the species. And he thinks, oh, my God, this is great. I'm going to be the, a stud, you know, put out to pasture. Sign me up. They fly him off you know, across the galaxy. And he gets there and finds that he's um, – it's more like he's going to be making – donations at a sperm bank all day. <laughs> but if that story does exist outside of Barry's memory, we couldn't actually find it. Some of the other writers, I think, just uh, all the, they helped me track down stories or remembered stories like that or gave, gave that kind of help. Yeah, I mean, now that you, you mentioned that, I mean, like, when I was reading this, there's a Harlan Ellison story that I vaguely remember where there's a guy and he, um, I think he's he's the last man and he, but then at some point he gets on the phone and it turns out there's another woman who's alive and then he goes to her and then he can't stand her and then he's trying to avoid her. I vaguely remember that one. I don't know if you came across that. It, it rings a bell. There were a couple other stories of Harlan's that I looked at, but none of them really quite fit the book right. There was a strange one that appeared in one of the second tier magazines of the fifties. Uh, where I think the male operative goes into a goes to a planet of women and he goes in disguised like with some kind of disguise as a giant woman spaceship. I, I it was very very odd and I didn't think the story quite worked. But it it didn't ultimately prove to be about repopulation. Uh, it, there were others, you know, I, I mentioned a few times now, there's this grail that I've read about a few times, I think, or maybe I've just repeated it a few times. Hmm. Uh, the story about uh, the PR, a guy who works in publicity, whose job is to convince humans to leave Earth and go off to another planet, I think Mars. And he does it so well that no one's left on Earth except him and he, uh, he's stuck supposedly repopulating the planet. And the story ends with the punchline that I don't know how to tell them that, uh, you know, I'm infertile. Huh. <laughs> you mentioned in the book that there was a Bob Shaw story that you weren't able to get the rights for. I was just kind of curious what that was right. and how, like, what, what the right situation with it was. Right. It's called, the story is called Call Me Dumbo. And it's a terrific story. But when I tracked down Bob Shaw's son, it turned out he had a reason for not wanting me to reprint it, and I w would desperately have loved to have changed his, to change his mind, but I didn't succeed, and I didn't push it, and he has his reasons. I'll just leave it at that. Mm. But uh, I, you know, it, it's in I think um, Assault on Tomorrow. It's definitely in one of his story collections, and I think it's available from Golands. All right, all right, cool. so so. Pretty much out of time, so I guess I'm just kind of curious uh, if there's any other. It looks like you've edited a bunch of anthologies. Do you want to talk a little bit about any other anthology you've edited or uh, will be editing? Well, I, I did I just brought out fairly recently my um, Welcome to Dystopia. Uh, my, we published it on the one year anniversary of Inauguration Day this year, and that's a. Uh, <laughs> uh, where, where the repopulation book is clearly uh, a historic anthology, the um, dystopia book is clearly about now. You know, I, I very aggressively tried to get the book to be uh, very near future speculations on, um, you know, of the sort of like, if this goes on with what our current um, American government administration is doing. So it, it's in the sense, you know, it's kind of the flip side of doing one book that involves a huge amount of research and doing, a, a, you know, a, and going, looking at everything through an historical lens. And then this other book that's clearly about today and, you know, getting a lot of writers to write off the top of their heads or from, more from their gut as to what's really moving them right now. And uh, other than that, I don't have anything, any more anthologies in the works. I mentioned that you were the editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction for 18 years. I'm just, I guess I'm just kind of curious if, uh, if it's different editing, editing these anthologies, if it's uh, less stressed, you don't have to reject people all the time. You can just kind of pick out the, the stories that you want. Oh, it, definitely. The, um, 
you know, obviously Go Forth and Multiply was a, you know, historic a reprint, so it's a completely different book, sort of thing. With the uh, just Welcome to Dystopia, I was able to approach writers and say, hey, can you give me a story of X thousand words by, you know, X date? And as you say, not have to uh, reject a lot of stories. You know, the, one of the drags of editing a, a magazine is having to say no to so many people so many times. It was a relief to do a book without having to go through that regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we are uh, all out of time. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Gordon Van Gelder. And again, this book, it's called Go Forth and Multiply. So, Gordon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Gordon Van Gelder for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Marcus Lauer and George Green, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. I also want to thank Solarius for sponsoring today's show. Learn more and get involved over at solarius.network. So again, that's C-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-S dot network. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.